Hi guys, good afternoon. Um, so today uh, we wrap up on the <laughs> today we wrap up on the foundation section of the class. Um, so we've looked at dualism. Um, we ha ha have been looking at behaviorism, and today we're going to wrap on behaviorism and look at central state materialism, the idea that the mind is identical to the brain. Um, and we'll look at one article by Hilary Putnam, Brains and Behaviour, that was designed to kill off behaviorism. Um, and uh, on Thursday, we move on to looking at functionalism. And one of a handful of the most important papers in uh, philosophy of mind um, since the 1960s, um, Putnam's The Nature of Mental States. That was really one of the first papers that articulated functionalism, um, which is still, I think, the dominant philosophy of mind. Um, okay, uh, today I, I, I'm going to pre present a way of reading the model of Putnam's um, uh, Brains and Behaviour article that takes it towards saying that the mind is the same thing as the brain, which is not quite the same as functionalism, but we'll come on to these distinctions in just a little bit. Uh, okay, um, everyone should have a copy of the topics for the first essay. Everyone have them? You presumably all had a quick look at them. Um, I hope they're all, well, they, it won't, uh, yes? I, it, it won't all make sense as yet, but um, uh, are there any questions about them so far? Any questions, comments? Okay, I would just draw your attention to the thing it says right at the head of the thing. The first paragraph of your essay must state the main thesis for which you wish to argue in the essay. The last paragraph must restate the main thesis, summarize the way in which you have argued for it, and indicate any outstanding problems. Um, somehow the psychology of it is that when you're writing this kind of essay, it's very natural to um, have your main point, your main conclusion, coming as a kind of surprise to the reader. So you think, um, um, what, what a, or, or, or how agreeably startled the reader will be when they get to the end and find out what you really think in this topic. And um, reading these things as, as someone who's writing it like that is like listening to someone who's trapped you in a corner and is telling you a very long story. And you really don't know if there's going to be a point to this or not. So. From the point of view of the reader, the way you have to train yourself to write is to do it backwards. Start out with your main point. Think of it like a newspaper article. A newspaper article has the main point already there in the headline. Right? So your first paragraph should be like a headline for the rest of your essay, saying what the take home message is. So whoever's grading your essay will already, by the end of the first paragraph, be saying, okay, what's the main thesis? What's the point gonna be? And then right at the end, um, you restate your main point, go over how you argued for it. And it's okay if you think there are problems for your view. I mean, your main point might be, look, I think dualism is just fine. I think dualism is right. That's great, I believe in it. I mean, you don't have to say this, but one option would be to say, I believe in ectoplasm. That's fine, that's your first paragraph. Um, I think the ectoplasmic view of the mind is correct. And uh, then at the end, um, restate your belief in the ectoplasmic view and indicate any problems you think there are for that view. Okay, is that reasonably clear what was being asked for there in the way you structure the essay? So you're looking for a thesis and a defense of that thesis against possible objections. Okay. Jackson, Austin, do you want to say anything? Is it, is it, okay. Yes? Do you want us to refer to texts? Uh, yes, I do. Well, I do want you to refer to texts. It's not... Um, the, the important point is the next one. Um, l let me just make a remark about this because this is about reference to texts. But I guess you've all come across the idea of plagiarism uh, at some point already. Um, you know, hopefully the, this, this class and the university in general is a very supportive environment. Everybody wants you to do well. Um, the one place where the, 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 the environment turns nasty 
is um, with plagiarism. Plagiarism being when you take text or ideas from someone else without saying that that's what you've done and pass it off as your own. Um, I mean, it, it happens now and then. It happens every other term or so. Someone just, usually I think someone just gets in a jam. They have no idea what to write about this essay and the due date is here. So you lift something off the web or something and it's kind of natural to do that. But um, the thing is, that's very easy to detect. And if it happens, you automatically get an F for the course and a note is sent to Student Judicial Affairs. Um, so basically the roof falls on you. It's really a very disagreeable business. Um, so taking ideas from other people, that's the whole point of the class, right? You're reading these texts and um, you're talking to the GSIs and you're hopefully getting ideas from other people the whole time. Um, but you have to say what you're doing. Is that completely clear? Yeah, yeah. So what format do you want them to study? Uh, there, anything that's clear. Yeah, I mean, you can use a bibliography at the end and citations al along the way, references to the bibliography, or you can put the full citation in the body of the text, or you can use a footnote. I don't know, do the GSIs do you, Austin? Is there anything that will, that enable me to get to the place that you're Yeah, to? yeah. Anything that's clear, um, yeah. Is that completely clear? I mean, this becomes like airport, uh, airline, you know, fasten your seatbelt messages after a while. But um, you, you, you presumably all had this kind of message before and you, you know what I'm talking about. Is that right? A anything in this not completely clear? So yes, references to the text. I mean, hopefully you're getting something out of the class and um, th there, is so there are some texts you want to refer to uh, in the essay. Okay, um, so today I want to start out by just going over what analytical behaviorism is and uh, uh, then Putnam's alternative view of words for mental states as cluster concepts. And then what he thinks is his key argument, the argument about super Spartans. Um, the general point I want to keep getting at is that what makes the mind so puzzling is the ways in which we know about it. It's very difficult to think of what the mind can be, how the mind can be physical, or how it can be made of anything else, given the ways in which we know about it and the ways in which we understand our own minds and other people's minds. So um, here's dear old Carnap, um, um, presumably in a state of high excitation, um, the explaining what excited means. So this is Carnap explaining the meaning of saying that someone's excited. Right, uh, so here it is. That physical structure um, or microstructure of Mr. A's body, especially of his central nervous system, that is characterized by a high pulse and rate of breathing, which on the application of certain stimuli may be made even higher, the pulse rate and the rate of breathing, by vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions, by the occurrence of agitated movements on the application of certain stimuli, etc. So that's what it is to be excited. So he's giving a definition there of excited and he's connecting being excited to behaving a particular way. So you could try doing the same for being angry, being upset, being in a state of deep joy, um, all, all these states. Um, this, is n this is analytical behaviorism. If you look at the second essay, it's talking about, uh, the second essay prompt is talking about analytical behaviorism. It's a view about the meaning of words for mental states. That's a little bit confusing if you know about um, behaviorism in psychology, where the whole idea of behaviorism in psychology, where um, Skinner and these guys were talking about behaviorism, was we don't want to talk about mental states at all. The idea was psychology is a scientific study of behavior and we should drop out talk of the mind as a lot of mumbo jumbo that's best left um, in the dark ages. You should describe and explain behavior without making any reference to mental events or other internal processes. So that was behaviorism uh, as a scientific movement in psychology also now gone out of the window. I mean, nobody in their senses now thinks that um, you should try and describe and explain behavior without talking about brains or, or mental states, right, into internal states. Yeah, I mean, any holdouts 
from behaviorism? No? Uh, scientific? Yes? Yes? Uh, no, the idea was to explain behavior, you should not talk about what's going on in the head at all. You should simply look at um, the environment that the animal is in and uh, how it's responding to that environment. And you shouldn't have internal constructs. The idea was that these are invariably just confusing and um, don't really make sense, can't really be uh, given clear definitions, was the objection. Um, it really is, I think, I think it's fair to say it's of mainly historical interest now, uh, that, that scientific movement. Okay, so analytical behaviorism is the idea. Have you guys come across the notion of an analytic truth? Okay, an <laughs> the idea of analytic is just, um, it's true in virtue of the meanings of the words. The, the statement just kind of spells out some of the meanings of the words involved. So after Monday comes Tuesday, orange is in between red, yellow and red. I mean, you didn't just notice that after, uh, it's not like in the, in the history of the world, you know, back in the um, cavemen discovered that Mon Tuesday comes right after Monday. And then they said, by God, look at this regularity. You know, it's happening again. I bet, you, you, you know, do, <laughs> we can build a system of thought here. And, you know, some eccentrics, you say, no, no, every seventh day, every seventh week, it's, um, you get a Wednesday right after Monday. That, that, yeah, that, there was never such a, I promise you there was never such a stage in human history, right? But you're just explaining what you mean, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. You just explain what the system is. That's the meaning of Monday. It's the one right in between Sunday and Tuesday. That's the meaning of um, Tuesday. It's the one right in between Monday and Wednesday, right? Yes? Right, okay. Um, so these things are, are analytic in the sense that they're not really reflections in how the world is. They're just spelling out the meanings of the words you're using. Yep. Well, I was going to ask, is, is an analytic truth then just based on societal knowledge? Because societal knowledge? Or knowledge of like what happens around us. Because if we didn't know what the days of the week were called, then the first statement wouldn't necessarily be true to us just because we wouldn't know what they were. Right. The thing is, this isn't really, it's not explicitly a statement about words, this, if you see what I mean. It's a, it's a little bit um, subtler than that. The, the statement about the meanings of the words, that's just a regular empirical fact. The word Monday, yeah, that could have been different. But the, the word Monday could have been used for Sunday. Are you following me here? We could have used the word Monday to stand for Sunday, yeah? But um, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the day Monday. And that's saying that day comes right after, uh, comes right before Tuesday. You, you see what I mean? So the societal knowledge would be knowledge of the arbitrary meanings of the signs of the language. But this is when you're actually using the language and you're saying something in it. And the thing is, this isn't giving anybody any news. If you understand what that's saying, you already know it's true, right? So just if you understand what any of these are saying, you know, you know that these are true, yeah? So contrast. There's a green fly on my roses, right? Is that true in virtue of the meanings of the words? No, that would be the wrong answer, right? Because, there, I mean, I have no idea if there's a green fly on your roses. Um, the whale is a mammal. Yeah, you didn't know that just by knowing the meaning of the word whale. Here comes the cook. I mean, it might be true and it might not. It has nothing to do with the meanings of the words. Well, it has something to do with the meanings of the words. You, you see what I mean? Is that reasonably clear? I'm not quite sure how to put this. On a scale of 1 to 10, <laughs> how clear is that? Yeah? Um, so the whale is a meaning of the concept. Isn't the fact that the whale is, like, isn't mammalia an internal property of whales? So isn't that similar to being a bachelor de mammalia for Yes. Well, is that right? I, I mean, I see what you're saying, but... Um, um, the, the whale is a mammal, that's something about the thing, right? You're saying it's really part of what that thing is, that it's a mammal. Yeah, that's very plausible. But you didn't, you didn't know that just by knowing that it's a whale. For all you knew, if whales might intrinsically be fish. You had to find out 
the, yeah, that they're mammals rather than fish, to find out what their actual internal nature is. Um, but with bachelors being unmarried, if you know that he's a bachelor, you know that he's unmarried. If you, it, it doesn't follow that being unmarried is part of what he intrinsically is, because notoriously that changes. You, you see what I mean? Um, you know, there are these stories about people who really are intrinsically unmarried, but <laughs> you don't have to be, as it were, intrinsically unmarried just to be a bachelor. That's right. Uh, the the, the mammal one is one you have to find out. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. An analytic truth, if you just know what it's saying, if you know what the words mean, then you understand what it's saying, then you know that it's true. Right? If you just know what these mean, these sentences, you already know that they're true. You don't really have to go and take a look. Yep. But you could know perfectly well what it means to say the whale is a mammal, but really not be sure whether it's true. You might think, but no, they're surely they're fish. You see what I mean? Tomatoes are, ve tomatoes are vegetables. Tomatoes are fruits. I <laughs> At the moment of speaking, you actually don't know which they are. Um, let's see. Fruit, are they? Okay. Well, take... <laughs> Sorry? They've seen... Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you're ahead of me. Okay. Um, but you see what I mean? You could know what it means to say a tomato is a fruit. Or, well, a tomato is a vegetable, but not know which way it goes, which one is true. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. So what analytical behaviorism is saying? Well, with Carnap's thing... What he was saying was, A is excited. That just means that's like, this is a complicated version of that whale, of that um, bachelors are unmarried thing. And there was a general idea that that really can't be true. I mean, some people, uh, I could be having a nervous breakdown, and if I'm really keeping my cool, you just might not be able to tell. I might not give vehement, my, my, uh, my answers to questions might be factually satisfactory even if I was having a nervous breakdown, so great is my cool, right? Um, I mean, th th there are people like that, right? You could be standing at the bus stop and they could be going through hell and you just wouldn't know about it. Their answers to questions are never vehement. Um, yeah, you, so that's too tight, you know, that's too close. You can see what Carnap means there. But people said that must be um, a little bit too strict, what Carnap's trying to do there. So analytical behaviorism says, there are entailments between, this is a quote from the Putnam article that we're looking at today. There are entailments between mind statements and behavior statements. Entailments that are not maybe analytic in the way that all bachelors are unmarried is, a, is analytic, but nevertheless they follow in some sense from the meanings of mind words. So it's a little bit loose what behaviorists were after. Um, but what you want is that, um, well what I want right now is a bit of chalk, but oh well. Oh yeah. Um, is that you got a word like angry, say, you got that mental term, angry, and then you've got a whole kind of cloud of behavior talk. Um, behavior talk, you know, stuff about thumping the table, shouting, um, looking for revenge, that kind of stuff, about the ways people behave, and it's kind of loose. It's not really very tightly defined that way, but you only understand what angry is when you understand the connections between anger and behavior, there's no more to the anger than the behavior, even though it's not really possible to specify in a very precise way which behavior is needed for someone to be angry. So these entailments between mind talk and behavior talk, these entailments might not let you translate mind talk uh, into behavior talk, but this is true for such superficial reasons as the greater ambiguity of mind talk as compared with the greater, relatively greater specificity of overt behavior talk. But so when you talk about someone's behavior um, explicitly, you're usually saying something fairly definite about it. Whereas when you say someone's really grumpy this morning, you say, look out, uh, he's on the warpath, then um, what you are saying is, you know the kind of behavior to expect, though it's not saying something particularly definite about that behavior, but that's analytical behaviorism. Is that okay for analytical behaviorism? You see what it's saying? Plain as day? Okay. Yes, good. Yeah.
Well, the, the, the mental term is specific in that it's one particular mental state rather than any other particular mental state. A but a bunch of different behaviours could um, constitute you being in that mental state. Yeah. yeah. You can show grumpiness in lots and lots of different ways. You can smile sweetly as you dig the knife in <laughs> to <laughs> express your grumpiness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now the thing about this is, the striking thing about, one striking thing about this is, um, if that's right, then you have to find out about your own mental states in the same way that other people find out about them. That you find out about other people's mental states by observing their behaviour, right? That's just kind of obvious. You, the all, all you've got to go on in finding out about someone else's mental states is how they're behaving. But on this view, according to analytical behaviourism, you'd have to find out about your own mental states by observing your own behaviour too. And last time I was arguing that uh, that's actually not as unreasonable as you might think at first. Um, it's natural to think that, well, I know about my own mind, all right, that's easy, I just look inside. And what I was arguing is that knowledge of yourself is often very difficult. It's not just a matter of glancing inside. That was um, Benjamin Franklin's insight that uh, knowing oneself is as extremely hard as hard as steel or diamond. Um, and when you think of knowledge of your own emotions, am I really in love or is it just a passing boyish infatuation? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you know about these kind of things about yourself um, in pretty much the same way that you know them about other people. You, you uh, observe yourself closely. You reflect on how you tend to behave. Um, and last time I was trying to give a whole bunch of examples that are like that. Do I have a good sense of humor? Well, you know that about yourself in pretty much the same way you know it about other people. So what I was arguing last time was that there isn't really a different basis for knowledge of your own mind from knowledge of other people's. So that part of behaviorism is really pretty plausible. Yeah, you don't really, you, 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 I mean, you're very expert in yourself, but you don't really know about your own mind in a way that's different to the way you know about anybody else. You happy with that? Yes? That's right. Well, and then analytics like, well, you can be excited and you can be happy. That's right. These can be lots of different ways you're tending to behave. Um, you, your way of being excited might be very different from my way of being excited. You see what I mean? Um, that um, you jump for joy and I, um, I tap my nose significantly. <laughs> I raise an eyebrow. Um, and that, but that's it. Yeah, uh, that's all there is to you being excited or me being excited is those behaviors, even though they're different for both of us. Uh, what makes it, what makes that like a philosophy? Like okay, well this is saying there's no more to being angry, there's no more to being excited than tending to behave in those ways. So you don't know about your own anger in a different way to the way you know about my anger. That's the view. I mean similarly for headaches, you know, uh, how do you know about my headache? Because I tell you because I'm I complain, right? How do you know about your own headache? Ah, no, not in this view. In just the same way. You know about your own headache because um, you hear yourself complaining. Um, you see that you're not managing to focus on your tasks. Right? Yes? Up until that example, like, I agreed with this viewpoint. But like, when you feel pain, like if you slice your arm open, like you feel... Okay. Well, what I've been arguing is that that's not right, that um, you slice your arm, you, the knife divides the flesh, um, and um, you cry out, yeah? You cry out in agony, and then you hear yourself crying out, and you say, boy, that really hurt me. You don't look inside at something. Yeah? Uh, 
the way I'm using mental state, it's a really broad term. It covers just everything that goes on in your mind. So a headache is a mental state. Anger is a mental state. Um, discovering a theorem is a mental state. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, anything that's to do with the mind is a mental state, the way I'm using mental state. Yeah. So what I'm saying is any of those sensations you find out just by observing your own behavior. OK, you comfortable with that? Yes? So what you mean is that I only know I'm feeling pain because other people have felt pain, and then I've observed that. And so I'm thinking that my reaction is yeah. the same as yours? That's right. You observe your, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, how do you teach someone the meaning of pain? You stick a pin in them, and you say, now you know what pain is, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, the, the, uh, um, well, the, the <laughs> I mean, that's very popular with small children, but that, the, the, that's not. <laughs> that's not really the recommended way. What you do is you point to someone who's undergoing agony. You point to someone who's had an accident and saying, boy, that really hurt them. Yeah. And then when you find yourself with a physical injury and yelling at the top of your voice, then you say, oh, I'm in pain too, right? Because I'm just behaving just the way that kid was. It's because it's a similarity in be your behavior that lets you know you've got the same mental state. Yeah. The way, I'm, the way I'm talking right now, the, the yelling is the behavior. Yeah? And, I'm, and the behaviorist is saying, there's no more to being in pain than doing the yelling. That's at the level of the behavior talk. Yeah? So all there is to finding out that someone's in pain is observing them yell. So in particular, knowing that you're in pain is just a matter of hearing yourself yell. Uh, yeah, one, two. Uh, it's a little bit more radical than that. It's not that the body interprets the mind. It's that there is no more to the mind than the body. There's no more to the mind than the behavior. Yeah. So and j just to go back to how we got here, remember there was this stuff about is the mind made of ectoplasm or what, what on earth is the mind? Um, and uh, then if you say, well, I just don't believe this stuff about ectoplasm. And then you say, well, what could the mind be? What could it be to be intelligent? Well, it's a matter of behaving in a particular complicated way. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do conscious people suffer pain? They can. Do conscious people, unconscious people suffer pain? Yeah. Uh, I would have thought not, but I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not dogmatic in the point. Yeah. Oh, their brain is it? Something's going on in their brain. Oh, so the pain was there all along, but they didn't know it. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm not unhappy with that. Remember, we were talking last time about um, uh, soldiers in battle uh, that, that are just like that. You know, they come to and they say, "Good, what? <laughs> my arm." Uh, yeah. That's right. That's what I mean. The, oh, I see. So, but they were. The, so they, the, 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 you're thinking that the soldiers in the battlefield might be yelling or whatever but saying I don't feel pain. I don't think that was actually the, the situation. I mean, the, the, this was, um, the f historically, the first time this was noticed was um, at Anzio, when um, a surgeon saw guys who had really bad injuries refusing medication and just carrying on, and were just amazed by this. Um, and the idea, the natural idea, is it's something about the focus of your attention when you're in the very kind of high stress situation that these guys were in, your attention is all focused on keeping alive, um, uh, making your way in this difficult environment, and you just don't focus on anything internal at all. Yeah. So th this fits with what you're saying about uh, sleep, right? That you could be having the pain, but just not realize it. Isn't that what you're saying? Behavior. Without consciousness. Yeah. This is a different issue, but isn't, isn't pain just a conscious state? OK, Jackson? Oh, I thought you were raising your uh, okay. Okay, are you Are you coming in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah good, yeah. Uh, actually, sorry, I have a different question. 
Okay. Um, do, uh, this is interesting, but I'm not. Uh, anyone want to come in on that? Uh, no. Okay. Yep. Yes, that, that, that's what he's saying, yeah. I guess what I think is very intuitive is if you can have pain without realizing that you have pain. There are people in a coma with Right. Um, the, the, that's the one that I find harder. Yeah, I mean, if consciousness has shut down, could there be dead people with pain? I mean, how far would you push it? Very good, yes, yes. So they're not only hypnotized, they're also trapped. Okay, okay. It's an interesting issue, and really, I mean, pain is a difficult case for a behaviorist. I hope that some of you are feeling that what I'm saying about pain can't be right. And it can't, it's crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it can't possibly be right. Um, but anyway. <laughs> Therefore, I'm in pain. Right. I think that's a very good question. <laughs> I mean, the behaviorist has to say, well, that's just the way your body works. It's nothing to do with the sensation of pain. Um, well, it's not ectoplasm. It's just talking about your brain. It's kind of the opposite of an ectoplasmic answer, actually. It's saying your mind isn't involved at all in causing you to scream. Your mind is only comes in in recognizing your, the existence of your behavior, of your screaming. The mind just is the screaming. If you think that view is crazy, then I think you're completely correct, <laughs> right? <laughs> but historically, it's been a very important view. And the, 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 uh, yeah. Yes, sure. Yes. If you fake it completely, then you have the mental state. That's right. Yeah. Um, if you deny cancer. <laughs> yeah, if ca well, if cancer was a mental state, that would work. If you denied it, then there would be none of it. Yeah? Yes? That's right. Okay, so there are going to be discriminations you want to make among pains that you wouldn't be doing on the basis of your reaction. Yeah, with all mental states. Yeah. I mean, if I'm a masochist and I'm really a connoisseur of pains, yeah, so I, 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 you've got the paper cut, you've got the dividing of the flesh, and uh, you've got the, what was the injury to the arm, yeah? yeah. So the, and these are different kinds of pains. That I might be, you're right, I might react in pretty similar ways, but when I say about the paper cut, Oh my, <laughs> let's do that one again, right? What I'm, I, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting you try this at home or anything. Um, <laughs> um, but if that's what I'm doing, I say, oh my, let's do that paper thing again. Um, then um, it seems to me very implausible that what I'm doing is observing my own behavior with great relish. That's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah well, what yeah. I mean is like certain people find certain things more painful. Like everyone has a different pain tolerance. Yes. So like right. if you're I don't know, I feel like you only know your own pain. And so uh -huh. so like yeah, you can observe other people that are in pain and that they're in pain, but if if you're in a lot of pain, then you're in a lot of pain no matter what. Even if it's a paper cut that makes you feel right. like a lot of pain. Okay, okay, good. And what what you guys are basically doing is shaping up for put to putnam super Spartans argument. Um uh, yeah. I mean Another second, and someone is going to do this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. One, two. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so we just had a way of dealing with uh, the argument of why like no one thinks it's hard about how like there's no way to uh, separate the will and the mind from the facts. Like they're just the same thing. That's right. R so Ryle is making the. Th this is really like Ryle's view that I'm setting out here. So Ryle's argument was: you think it, you naturally think of the mind as a kind of ectoplasm, 
And then you think, well, how does that connect up to all the behavior and so on? And Ryle's answer was, that is so puzzling, and the mind seems like such a deep mystery when you think of it like that. But that is a mistake. All that there are here are various ways of classifying complex behaviors. That's all there is to the mind. Yeah, that's, that's why there are these connections there. You've just got different classifications of behavior. Yeah. And the great advantage of it, the great liberation, is that it gets you away from all the stuff about ectoplasm. Yeah. The unfortunate fact is that it's bonkers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean that in a technical sense. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Strongly agree. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, a, a, a friend of mine who works in the city said, when my mother died, no one in the office could have told. Yeah, you can be absolutely churned up, but I'm um, not sure a bit of it. Yeah. That's difficult. Um, Jackson, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you might be bottling it up, but there's something being bottled up here, and when the um, um, when the restraints come off, it's all going to pour out. Th 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 that's the point. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas um, if 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 I'm not bottling something up, then when the restraints come off, I don't behave any differently. You see what I mean? So. I, I guess y y if you think, the behaviorist could say, these kind of cases where you're just faking it really well, you are bottling up some behavior, you are cor corking up some behavior here, and when you take out the cork, when you're left alone or whatever, then boom, out comes this, um, you, you start yelling or sobbing or um, biting the carpet or whatever you do. Yeah. Uh, okay, last, last one, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, all that ha this view has to say all there is to being stressed is tending to behave in lots of different ways. You know, someone says to you, um, "Watch out for Bill. He's under a lot of stress right now." You don't know exactly what to expect, but you know the kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, his sense of humor might not be that good, n n n n and so on, yeah. Uh, uh, so it's loosely connected to behavior, is, is what that theory says. Okay, uh, so that's analytical behaviorism. So I want to sketch out Putnam. Putnam's got a quite different way of thinking about the connection between the mind and behavior, which is that these words like anger or pain or whatever are what he calls cluster concepts. So um, he says there are a million and one different ways of saying what pain is. A whole cluster of behaviors that exhibit pain. So pain is that feeling which you can normally evince by saying ouch, by wincing, or in a variety of other ways, or you might not evince it at all. So if you have kids learning, what pain is, the way they have to do it is by seeing each other when they're in pain. You do have to learn what kind of behavior is connected to pain. Um, and the picture is, suppose you think, yep. Uh, yeah, well, you're, when you're, sorry, uh, yeah, when you're learning the meaning of the word pain, you need someone to, clue you in as to which state it is that we're talking about. Uh-huh. And the one fold. The one what? The one fold. Folds? Oh, falls, yes, right, right, yes. Right, yeah, sure, sure. Um, this, ha this happens several times and they don't see any adult person. Yes. They would not learn what pain is and they would not know what pain is. Well, yeah, I, 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 they wouldn't know what the word, the word pain means. 
Well, not because they know what the word pain means. Uh, right, that's not why they're crying. Yeah, they, they feel it, right? There's two things here. There's having it and there's knowing what it is. Yeah, so remember, this is why I went through that stuff about analytic. We're talking really here about the meanings of words. The mean, how, not whether you have the state, but what the word for the state means. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, okay, so you newborn infants, yeah, they can have pain, all right, but knowing the meaning of the word pain is something that comes a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly that that's how you're su supposed to feel, but, but yeah, th actually there's something right about that, yeah. That um, um, you're learning the meaning of the word pain by some, you're being taught the meaning of the word pain by someone who knows when your behavior is indicating pain, yeah? And then you have to be able to use other people's behavior to tell when they have, in pain, have, have pain, yeah? It, you you really got to have that to know what pain is. Th th that's the idea. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so if you're never told the meaning of the word pain, you can still experience pain, right? You just no question about that. Animals and very young children could still have the pains, all right. They just yeah, don't know what it is. What it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Putnam's picture is, is. I think this is a way of putting what Putnam's picture is. is suppose you think about a doctor in a country practice who gets a whole bunch of strange symptoms. I mean, people come to the surgery and they say things like, I've got a strange cough and I'm really sensitive to light. I just can't bear bright light. And um, you get a whole, uh, people, people keep coming in with these strange symptoms. They're getting headaches. And um, um, the, after a bit, the doctor says, look, something's going on here. Um, these guys are all miners, let's suppose, that have these symptoms. They are all working deep underground. So you say, what we've got here is that we've not just got isolated symptoms here, the coughing and the sleeplessness and the light and the headaches. Um, these are all part of a single disease. There's a, well, there's a syndrome here. I mean, that's usually what happens with things like Legionnaire's disease or AIDS, that you find out the symptoms first, and then you say, well, I guess there's a single disease here. Um, and it's not straightforward to know when you're right to do that and when not, because sometimes it might turn out, like in this example, it might turn out that the cough really has nothing to do with it, that there is really a new disease here, but that these guys all having a cough is just a kind of accident. They're getting that as a, as a result of them all being minors. But that's not really what, what, they, what, what, what they're really getting here is some kind of um, um, migraine or something. Um, and it's a different kind of uh, uh, disorder than what's responsible for the cough. So when you've got a real syndrome here, you've got a set of symptoms where if someone comes in and says, well, I'm getting the headaches and I'm getting the sensitivity to light, and you can predict, you can say to them, well, are you having trouble sleeping? And they say, yeah, I'm having trouble sleeping too. That's when, one set, one of the when some of the symptoms predict the rest, you regularly get these symptoms as a group. Then you say, there's a real single disease here. There's an underlying virus that is causing all these symptoms. Right, that's how it goes in it. That's how it went with Legionnaire's disease or with AIDS, that you say, we bet there's a virus there. We bet there's some underlying thing that is causing all these symptoms. So um, Putnam's example is polio. Um, if you've got polio, that having polio is not a matter of having the symptoms of polio. I mean, there is a virus. And to have polio is to have the polio virus. But the only way the virus got tracked down was by knowing what symptoms it generally produces. Um, so 
you could have the symptoms of polio, but for some quite different reason, some other awful thing had happened to you, not polio, not that virus. So you had the symptoms, um, but not the virus, then you wouldn't have polio. And Putnam's idea is pain is like that. All the terms for mental states are like that. If Martians came down and were observing us and they saw things like, um, look, look at this guy, he's um, banging a nail into the wall with a hammer. He hits his thumb with a hammer. What happens? He hops, he sucks his thumb, he cries out, he winces. Um, that happens again and again. You get these symptoms and you say, there's something going on here. This is the way these humans work. There is something happening that is causing that cluster of symptoms, just as there can be something happening that causes a disease, the symptoms of a disease. Um, similarly, with something like jealousy, the Martians say, look, what is human love? Um, how does human love work? And um, you look at these symptoms and jealousy, the symptoms of jealousy, the parked car at 3 a.m., the, um, uh, the phone taps, the, uh, the, the opening the email account, all that stuff is right in there. And the Martians observing this say, something's going on here. We've got a syndrome here. Let's call that jealousy. Now, you could have asymptomatic jealousy, if you see what I mean, just as someone could be lucky and have the polio virus without having any of the symptoms. You, know, you, you can have a disease asymptomatically. Um, you could have the pain asymptomatically, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and so you have the pain, but you don't do any of that stuff. But you still identified what pain is by saying it's the, it's the thing that is usually causing those symptoms. Yep, one, two. Yeah, it, 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 it implies a lot of similarity between people in their mental states. Yeah, I wouldn't push it as far as saying that we don't exist as individuals or something like that. Um, but just that jealousy is jealousy, whether it occurs in you or in me. It's, yeah, it's certainly not unique. Sometimes people have ideas, you know, when you look inside yourself, your own mind is as distinctive as a taste of pitch. You know, there's that indefinable meanness that accompanies every mental state I have, yeah, and the, but makes it quite alien to anything you could have. So this is contradicting that and saying, no, you can have the same kind of state in many people. Yeah, yeah. Can you go back to when you said you could have uh, all the symptoms of, for example, polio, yeah. but not have polio? Yes. So I'm going, uh... Yeah, okay, well, you could have the virus, but um, the virus is, I, don't, I mean, I, mean I, I don't really have the technical vocabulary to explain what's going on, but you have the virus, but it's just not active. It's just not, I mean, there's a process by which the virus has to generate paralysis, for example. I mean, here are your hands out here. Uh, for the virus to get to them, um, there ha there's a process that it has to go through. So the virus could be there, though it doesn't go through that process. But how does that relate to the other things about like, the general symptoms? I'm sorry, I'm confused. Oh, well, this is, this is I, I mean this to be a simple example. Um, <laughs> I mean, it seems complex, that's unintentional. Um, uh, that, I mean, I think that is how words for diseases work, right? Yeah, I mean, some. I mean, there is. Aren't these there are these famous cases of people with HIV, where um, they've got the virus all right, but it's just not showing up in symptoms anymore. Yeah, isn't that right? There are people who who live for ten years or more with. Yeah, they're right. They, right, you don't have any symptoms for the first while. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a process by which the virus generates the symptoms, and you could have the virus without that process being gone through. Okay. Yeah? yeah, yeah. You still needed the symptoms to get on to the virus. To like get it dying. Yes, exactly, to identify it in the first place. Yep. Well, 
That's right. So the idea is that's like someone who has the symptoms but without having the virus. Is that a camera example? No, it, it fits very well with it because um, see, uh, that, that's what I was saying about someone could have the, um, uh, if you've got all the symptoms of polio but you don't have the virus, that's not polio. So if you're faking it with pain, you've got all the usual symptoms, right? You hop, you suck your thumb, you say, oh my God, all that stuff. But um, you don't have the pain if the, usual, if the right cause isn't there. So pain is the cause of all those symptoms, but you only manage to identify that thing by knowing what the symptoms were. So what we, this is Putnam, what we mean by pain is not the presence of a cluster of symptoms, but rather the presence of an event or condition that normally causes those responses. Right, so this is what you guys were saying, really. It's not the behavior that's the important thing, it's the feeling that is underlying the behaviors. Yep, so behavior is still important because behavior is how you diagnose the thing in the first place. The Martians looking at us um, and saying there's such a thing as love, there's such a thing as jealousy, um, there's such a thing as being really grumpy. Um, these are useful classifications that let you get onto, that let you target the underlying causes in human beings. So that's Putnam's um, theory of uh, mental state concepts as cluster concepts, right? The pain, the, the behavior is diagnostic of the underlying mental state. And the thing is, what is the underlying mental state? It's a brain state. I mean, we all know what causes behaviors. It's different aspects of your brain. So if you think of it like that, the, the pain must be a brain state because we know the causes of behavior. Okay? Yep. But isn't that going against the whole thing of analytic behaviorism? Yes, it throws it out. Okay. Yeah, this is throwing out analytic behaviorism. This is saying analytic behaviorism was right to give some importance to the behaviors, but the behaviors are important as symptoms, not because they actually define what the thing is. Yep. Okay. Um, so here's Putnam's killer argument, um, uh, the argument about super Spartans. Um, and really, uh, th this is a very simple argument, and he is basically amping up what a lot of you guys were saying. If you guys amped up what you had been saying just 10 minutes ago, uh, then you get this argument. The idea is that you have a people who think is very, I don't know, undignified or shows low breeding to um, exhibit any signs of pain. Let us suppose they are a warrior people. Um, and um, if the steel divides their flesh, do they wince? Do they hop? They do not. Do they even so much as raise an eyebrow or flare a nostril? They do not. Um, uh, they don't behave in any of those ways. Um, and let's suppose that if you do behave in those ways, you are very unpopular. You are not going to mate um, if you behave in those ways um, when you have pain. If you exhibit pain in any way, then... Um, your line dies out. So people might say they're in pain, but they don't do any of that undignified stuff of yelling or shouting or whatever, um, banging on the floor, pleading. Um, and eventually, after many centuries, these people are born that way. So after a few centuries, when these people feel pain, they're not, it's not even that they have to bottle it up. Um, the tendency to express the pain has just been bred out of them. So they, they, they feel pain all right. They can be undergoing the agonies of the damned, but in no way do they exhibit it to each other or even when they're alone, and they don't have any tendency to exhibit it. Putnam's point is that makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm not saying it's likely, but it could perfectly well happen. Yep. <laughs> That's a great example. You, you could have a race of um, 
I don't know what the opposite of a Spartan would be. Um, yeah, super, super hypochondriacs who are always exhibiting pain behaviours. Yeah, who exhibit pain behaviours more or less continuously or at any rate at random. Yeah, that could be too. Yeah, and it's, it's, the, the pain behaviour has just lost any connection to the sensation of pain. You can make sense of that too. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, that has never occurred to me. But sure, of course you're right. Yeah. Um, okay, so... If you have these super Spartans, then the analytical behavior picture isn't true. Of, uh, analytical behaviorist picture isn't true of them at all. They have the pain, all right, but they don't have the slightest tendency to express it in their behavior. And many of you guys were saying things more or less along those lines. This is a very simple example that makes the point. There is an X world where these people don't even talk about pain anymore. So, the, 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 I mean, they don't do anything as low-bred as talk about pain. Um, but they still have the pain. If you divide their flesh, they still suffer. So, you, we were talking earlier about whether someone in a coma or someone asleep could feel pain. Um, and, um, yeah, anesthetics are actually pretty interesting. Uh, there was a case of an anesthetic that was found to combine um, a, a, an analysis of how the anesthetic worked was that it combined a muscle relaxant and an amnestic. That is, by an amnestic, I mean it had something in it that made you lose your memory for the time during which it had been administered. Yeah? So it was used for surgical operations, this thing. Um, and when you think about how that's working, um, well, you, there you are on the operating table. You've got this muscle relaxant. So whatever is going on as they cut open your rib cage, um, you're not going to be able to move at all because you have the muscle relaxant. And afterwards, they'll say to you, you OK? You say, I'm fine, because you have the amnestic. But just between you and me, would you want to take that anesthetic if you're going in for the operation? Yes? Yeah. Is it a painkiller, a hypnotic, and, and a relaxant, right. OK, suppose you missed out the painkiller and you had only the relaxant and an amnestic, yeah? People would wake up from their operations and say, that was fine. I think they would feel worse. That's your guess? They yeah, they, they might feel worse, but they wouldn't be able to pinpoint it and say, I was suffering. Yeah, that's the whole point of having the, saying there's an amnestic in there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You don't have the slightest tendency to behave anyway. Yeah? Because that the ability has been taken away from you. But the terrifying thing is you could still be feeling every moment of it as the saw went through your rib cage. This was actually used. Yeah. Keeping awake? It depends what you mean by awake. If someone who can't move an inch, awake. Presumably, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Um, you couldn't have told by looking at them. You couldn't have told from their behavior. Yeah. Sorry, I, do, <laughs> I hope this is not too horrific. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> okay. But you wouldn't want to use that, right? So pain and your knowledge of pain, there's a little bit indirect, the connection. Um, I mean, these soldiers in the battlefield or the football players or whatever, um, they also suggest that you've got to be attending to, f to, um, to know that you've got the pain. If you're not attending, then it seems entirely possible that you could have the pain but not know about it. I mean, we had that example of um, you've got a headache and then you're watching a movie that is very gripping and uh, you get r r caught up in the movie and then the minute the movie slows down, you notice the headache again. Um, I mean, sure, that, that, that happens the whole time, right? That, um, but it seems kind of strange to say, well, the headache went away. It's not that the headache went away. You just weren't noticing it. So now consider um, 
Putnam's ex-world again. So you had these super Spartans who were bred never to uh, express pain. Now, you could, if you can imagine that, you could also imagine that the super Spartans are bred never to attend to their own pain, right? It could be that um, it's, just, it's just thought of as self-indulgent. This is a warrior people. They do not bother indulging in noticing their own pain. They just get on with stuff. Um, yeah, there are some parts of the present day world where you might think it's kind of like that. Um, I, was one, I w once talked to someone from New York about um, what was so awful about pain. And he said, well, it kind of get, it gets in the way. You, can, you can't get on with life if you have pain. And really, that anyway, um, that's the kind of New York attitude. Don't attend to your pain, right? Don't even notice it yourself. So you can imagine that going on for generation after generation. It's not just that you don't express your pain to other people. You don't even attend to it when you have it yourself. Maybe now and then it obtrudes on you, but basically you just blank pain. You just get on with stuff. Um, now, it seems to me you could imagine a why world like that. It's not just that other people don't know about your pain. You don't even know about it, except now and then. And the thing is, that could be our world. It could be that this room right now is an ocean of suffering. It's just that for generations of reading, you don't have the tendency to express it in your behavior anymore. You don't even have the tendency to attend to it yourself. It's only with great difficulty that you could be brought to attend to your pain. So this room right now, though everyone looks outwardly calm, and some are frankly asleep, <laughs> despite this calm surface, it makes perfect sense to suppose that everyone is suffering enormous physical agony. Yeah, the ex-world. He, 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 yes. He says that uh, eventually there's more in that world. Um, but isn't that like, isn't that like the Marxian revolution? Isn't that like saying that, um, like, things that we adopt, like, as a culture... Yes. Become, like, like, modern, like, yes. Uh, yes, well, uh, okay, if you, if you don't like it happening in a few centuries, it could happen over many, many thousands of years. The, they were by their culture to not stand up to I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 So like in Africa women are more attracted than they have along the next level with men. Uh -huh. But even if they do that more quickly, eventually they still become like these other people. All right. Yeah. Well I I guess what we'd have to suppose is that there are some genetic tendencies in how much they tend to express their pain or attend to their own pain. And that those genetic differences are gradually amplified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You might say, like, uh, you don't really need to worry about whether or not the revolution is an error, though. Uh, you, know, you might think, uh, yes. you have good reason to think the Marxian revolution does not happen, because uh, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, the important point uh, for just to understand that it's, concept it's a conceivable. For yeah, the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the analytical behaviorist is going to say that's just a contradiction, it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so you, are you all, what's going on? Oh, I've gone backwards. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so are we all happy with that? Yeah. An ocean of suffering. Okay, um, so here, here's Putnam stating his theory. What we mean by pain is not the presence of a cluster of responses, but rather the presence of an event or condition that normally causes those responses. And then you can go further and say, well, what is that cause? I mean, what causes you to hop and suck your thumb and wince and all that? 
Well, it's your brain, right? Your brain makes you do that stuff. That's what they do over in the psychology buildings, the neuroscience buildings. They look at how your brain makes you do stuff. So if what's causing the hopping and wincing is the state of the brain, um, and pain is just whatever that cause is, then pain must be a brain state. Yep. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, your hand, for example. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? Is there any action? Well, any behave behaviors are typically caused by the brain. That's right. And if the words for mental states are names for the causes of behaviors, then they must be names for particular types of brain state. Yep, that's OK. That's straightforward enough. OK, that's central state materialism. Yep. Um, the idea is, it often happens you can have two different ways of identifying one and the same thing. I mean, for example, you say, there's heat, there's what you feel, the thing, the thing about, the, about the object you feel when you put your hand in a radiator or um, into ice. There's heat, and then there's a scientific identification of heat as motion of molecules. People knew what gold was um, in ancient times, but you can say, that stuff that everybody knew about, that is um, uh, uh, atomic number 79, or water that people knew about for uh, millennia, that just is H2O, right? So you can identify the same thing two different ways. So you can take lightning and say, there you go, what, what, what in the world is that? Well, lightning is, what is lightning? Lightning is discharge of electricity caused by ionization of the atmosphere. Am I remembering that right? Is it discharge of ions caused by electrification? No. Uh, <laughs> OK, discharge of electricity caused by ionization of the um, atmosphere. And you look at the lightning, and you think, gee whiz, look at that. Look at that stuff. Look at that. How could that be something as prosaic as a discharge of electricity caused by ionization of the atmosphere? But it just is, right? It's just the same thing. Um, so similarly, you say pain, how could pain be sea fiber firing? How could this thing I feel right now, how could that be sea fiber firing? Well, it just is. It just it seems kind of unlikely that the lightning is electrical discharge due to ionization of the atmosphere. It seems kind of unlikely that pain is sea fiber firing, but they're both just true. That's what central state materialism says. It just is a kind of state of your brain. Yeah, you diagnose that there must be such a state in the same way you diagnose that there must be a virus underlying HIV. Um, and you, you zone in on it by the behavior. But then science can take over and say, and here's what that stuff is. So pain is the underlying cause of you wincing, hopping, crying out, sucking your thumb, and so on. We found out scientifically it's in your C fibers fire that you do that stuff. Therefore, pain is just C fiber firing. OK, we can, pack, we can actually pack up the class there, right? I mean, what board do you want? Uh, the, 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 yes? Uh, well, you said there's two ways of identifying stuff. Yes, that's right. Yeah, like, like lightning and um, discharge of electricity due to ionization of the atmosphere. Yeah. Oh, so those, are the two different those are the two different ways. ways. Yeah. Yeah, we th you usually think that one of them is, is telling you what it really is. Um, so you'd think this is telling you what the thing intrinsically is when you say C fiber firing, whereas just describing it as um, wh whatever is typically causing this stuff, that's like just your way of, yeah. Exactly, right, right. Just as you could say, what Legionnaire's disease was by saying the kind of context in which you get it and what the symptoms are, or you could do it by specifying what the virus is. Yep. Okay. Very good. Yep. Yeah, this is materialism. Yeah. Yeah. It says pain just is the C fiber firing. So all there is to the mental state is things going on with this bit of matter. There's more to it, there's no more to it than that. Um, did I write that down? Yeah, pain is C-fiber firing, right? There's no more to pain than C-fiber firing. Forget all that stuff about ectoplasm and forget the idea that behavior is the key thing. 
It's your brain that is the key thing. For the reason that someone just gave, your brain is the cause of practically any complex behavior that you go through. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, uh, th this is a little bit more explicit than Putnam is, I think. But yeah, I think this is the natural reading of what Putnam is doing in that article. Yeah, yep. Can you completely reject the ectoplasm? This throws the ectoplasm out of the window, that's right. So I said there were three big views that we were going to look at, dualism, behaviorism, and central state materialism. This is central state materialism, and this is throwing the other two out. Yeah. It can't be right, it seems to me. Um, and there are two reasons why <laughs> some of you will be quite concerned. <laughs> but, uh, this is Putnam, yes. Oh. Okay, this, so, I'm saying, okay, this model, um, uh, uh, no, it's fine, I'm going over lots of different views without <laughs> always highlighting who's, what, who's saying what. But I say, Putnam is saying, you use the behaviors to identify the underlying brain state, but there is no more to the pain than the underlying brain state. Yeah. And similarly for any mental state, jealousy, anger, love, whatever. Yeah. Would Putnam have identified himself as a central state materialist? I, I think it's not that explicit, uh, actually, in that article. Um, the, the reason I'm pausing a bit in this is that Putnam went on in the article we're going to look at next to develop a quite different view that is really what he's famous for, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but it's not. But, but my read of this article is that it is central state materialism. Yeah, Putnam would not have used that term himself. I think. Is that what do you think, you guys? Putnam can be famous for saying a lot. Yes. Yes. I, I think in this article, the natural read of this article is that it's central state materialism. Yeah. But as we'll see. Uh, uh, as you will see, there are reasons for to hedge a bit in that. Yeah. yeah. OK. But certainly, there are plenty of people who comfortably say pain is C-fiber firing. Yeah. If you look at the articles by Smart and Armstrong in the Jackson collect in the Chalmers collection, for example, you'll see th th these guys are very blunt, flat-footedly saying pain is C-fiber firing. They're, they're real gung-ho central state materialists. Yeah. Um, OK. But, and it's a very natural view, right? Uh, uh, I mean, everybody agrees that your brain's important. Um, so this is a way of saying how come your brain's important. Um, but look, think about this. Suppose you see a flash of lightning in the sky. or you, you see a flash of what you think is lightning in the sky, but it's not actually an electrical discharge uh, due to ionization of the atmosphere. Suppose you see that and you say, wow, look at that lightning, but actually, is not a discharge of electricity due to ionization of the atmosphere. It is, let us suppose, the first um, blast from the death rays of the approach approaching Martian battle fleet. Um, then is that lightning? It looks like lightning. But is it lightning? Of course it's not lightning. I mean, <laughs> of course, if it, if it really is the Martian death fleet, then um, you have other things to worry about, than whether that's lightning or not. But um, for present purposes, that's the important question. And that is not lightning, right? It can look like lightning. It can seem like lightning. But it is not um, a discharge of electricity due to ionization of the atmosphere. Then it's not really lightning. Yeah? So is what you're saying uh, that symptoms are uh, misleading? Symptoms can be misleading, yeah. Um, uh, it can feel like heat. But if it's not motion of molecules, then it's not heat. Yeah, it could look like water, but it, uh, and this is really the same thing as the uh, having the symptoms of polio without having the polio. Yeah, um, but suppose you have the feeling of pain. Suppose that it's twenty years from now, and you are at the dentist's, and you are you have um, they have a scanner on you while they do the dentistry. And you think, my God, you feel these jolts, these molten jolts. <laughs> I don't know why I'm using such negative examples. I should be using joy, right? <laughs> but somehow it always seems more definite when you're using pen. But anyway, so suppose you're at the dentist and you're feeling these jolts. And the dentist is looking at the scanner. And the dentist is saying, I know it feels like pain, but actually it's not C-fiber firing. So d not to worry, <laughs> don't make such a fuss. Um, 
I know it feels just like pain, but the scanner is showing decisively that you do not have C-fiber firing. Therefore, it's not pain. Oh, well, that's all right then. Sorry? It's not going to make you feel any better, and it's not going to make it not be pain. And how could it not be pain? If it feels like pain, there's no more to it being pain than that. Something can look just like lightning, but not be lightning. Something can't feel just like pain, but not be pain. I mean, Putnam puts it like this. Um, one can have a pink elephant hallucination, right? That makes sense. You know, you're sitting in the bar, um, you look over in the corner, you see a pink <laughs> elephant, you think, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, we've all been there, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so that makes sense. You, 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 you could have the hallucination of the elephant there, but no elephant, right? But with hallucination, could you have a sensory experience of pain without really there being any pain? That's what the dentist is trying to tell you. It's not really pain. Feels like pain. But that makes no sense. Pain just is the sensation. If you've got the sensation, then you've got the pain. And nobody, by going into the biology of the situation, can show that you're not feeling pain. And Put Putnam puts it like that. Any situation that a person cannot discriminate from a situation in which they themselves have pain, that is a situation in which you have a pain. If you're in a situation that you can't tell apart from one in which you have pain, that's being in pain. Uh, the, <laughs> the, it goes two ways. Actually, let me flip forward here. Oh, plastic. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm saying if you think you've got the pain, then you have got the pain. The thing that you're about saying about the headache is if you've got the pain, then you know you've got the pain. You see what I mean? You're taking the arrow this way. I'm talking about the arrow going this way. It, does that make sense? Oh, I see. Yes, that's right. That's right. They're, 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 the other, they're, they're opposite. They're complementary sides. Yeah. I'm, I and Putnam are saying you can't have a pain hallucination. You're saying you can't have an absence of pain hallucination. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. That, I, 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 I agree that that does seem to uh, uh, fit. Mm -hmm. Because you can be hypnotized and control You can be hypnotized. Right. Like you can be sitting there and feeling a lot of pain and somebody okay. thinks, we're just on the half hour. We're going to have to stop that. Okay, wonderful questions, you guys. Thank you. Okay. I,